Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Welcome to our in-person students, our online students. Thank you all for joining us. And also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Uh, today, we'll um, look at and study chapter three, uh, timeline. Uh, we look at history uh, about uh, you know, reformation, revivals, how God restored the church and missions. So we're going to study uh, history from the day of um, the death of Jesus, uh, the Pentecost, you know, uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, the centuries and how God moved and how God brought the church to where it is today. Okay. So it's an exciting um, study. Uh, I don't know how many of you like history, don't like history. Uh, if you don't like history, don't worry about all the dates. Okay. Just look at the people and how they, you know, how God used them and how they gave their lives for, you know, um, the teaching, um, for bringing about reformation, preserving the scriptures, preserving the doctrines, um, also translating the scriptures uh, so that each one of us can have you know, the Bible in our hands, and also how um, they brought about reformation and revivals and, um, you know, went ahead and uh, did great ministry. And so we can learn from that, okay? So before we look at chapter 3, uh, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Online students? Anyone like... Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, God, we praise and thank you for this lovely time of, Lord, fellowship which you have given out of your grace, O oh Lord God. Lord, help us to, Lord, listen and, Lord, imbibe the truths, Lord God, which you are going to study, O oh Lord God. Help it, us to, Lord, bear much fruit and, Lord, grow in your likeness. For we ask all this in the mighty and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Esther. So in this chapter, we'll travel through almost about 2,000 years of church history, okay? And we'll look at it in a chronological way, listing out the key events and the lives of people who had significant impact on the life and the ministry of the church, okay? There are several people and there are several events that have helped shape the life, the journey of the church, and we have only listed there's only few listed here and in that few that is listed actually is not few but it's quite an extensive uh, you know study that uh, pastor has put in here and you know i just appreciate the hard work he's done in putting out all of these details um and also he sees the importance of us knowing it and learning it also the holy spirit uh, wants us to know and uh, see all of this so that we as a present church present day church can learn from this. So even as pastors put out some extensive, you know, details about church history, we are just going to, uh, because of the lack of time, otherwise we'll study this uh, chapter two, the rest of the whole semester. Okay. So just because of the lack of time, we, I'm going to pick up important, significant um events that have uh, you know shaped the life and the journey of the church okay now you can ask why do we have to look at it if you look at chapter three if you just turn your pages you will say you'll see ad 64 ad 66 ad 70 90 it goes on and on and on and you'll be wondering why so much of you know um, uh, 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 history details that are given here but are a purpose in looking at history of the church is to learn from the past. Yes. What happens when we learn from the past? We may do not re repeat the mistakes. Yes, we won't repeat the mistakes. Thank you. Why else should we look at the past? What happens when you look at the past? It motivates you. It encourages you. Yes. It shows your mistakes that people have done in the past, how you can avoid it, okay? Yes, we can learn from it, yes. Thank you, Andrew, thank you as well. You know, we can learn from what has happened in the past and how we can move ahead as a church. Anything else? Yes, 
past uh, the way god uh, did the works for them so okay the way is... god worked his pattern of working so we can understand his pattern of working even today yes okay so we can when we look at the past church history or what god has done not just church history, even in the Bible, when you look at the Old Testament, we learn and recognize God's pattern of working. See how he works and how he does things, okay? And it's important for us to understand the history of the church because we can understand where we are today, how we came to this place, what happened in the past to bring us to where we are today. Now, in your own life, if you look at, your life in the past, you will think, hey, if I had only done that, you know, I would have been somewhere else. You know, if I had only not heeded to the voice of the Lord, I would have destroyed my life. Or if only God would not have saved me, I wouldn't have been alive today because some of us would have thought of even ending our lives or some of us would have thought of giving up on life. Just if God or somebody would have not, God would have not sent somebody to encourage me, I would have given up on life okay i would have ended my life so when we look at the past you can see how god brought you out of all those struggles and difficulties to where you are for some of you were saying must be looking at your past and saying you know we were in such poverty we had such financial difficulties in our home but how God brought us out. At least now we can eat three meals. We have a proper house. We're able to manage things. Yes or no? You know, whenever I sit with my dad, he's constantly telling me stories of the past, what God has done in the past. So if I tell, go with him, in case I tell him any problem that I'm facing, he will start with his stories of what God has done in the past. And he keeps remembering that. He keeps saying that over and over again because he say, hey, if, if God did that in the past, he can do that even today, okay? So we know that, you know, um, when we look at the past, uh, where we are and where, where we were and where we are today, you know, it helps us also to correctly interpret the present where we are today, okay? So it, it helps us to understand. It also helps us to know, you know, the God that we serve and what he can do in our lives okay now if we get into problems and if as a church or as individuals and if we interpret those problems in isolation that means if a church is going through some problem and we interpret that in isolation you know it can lead into a lot of wrong errors and doings okay but we need to know the past what brought us here and what caused these things to come together and why we are here it gives us more meaning it gives us more value to the church to the bible that we have to the doctrines that is being taught and to the the move of god and what the holy spirit is doing we value it we will hold it with you know uh, with a sense of um, um, uh, a, a reverence a sense of awe we will not take it lightly and say anyway this is the bible so what you know it's only doctrines you know, or it's just a church. But if you look at church history, I hope it will open your eyes to see the price people paid to have what we have today. And we will value that. We will cherish that. We will build on that. And we will take the church to the next level of glory that God has envisioned for the church or take ourselves to the next level of glory that God has envisioned and purpose for us. Okay. So, um, it's also important to look at the complete picture and to recognize the connections between reformation, revivals, and restoration of the church, missions, and church growth. Because all of these are related to one another, and all of this is what is happening in the life of the church. Okay. Also, it will help us to determine the right course of action that we need to take now. Like most of you said, you know, we don't um, uh, repeat the mistakes that have happened in the past. Okay. And um, when we look at uh, 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 things, we will also be encouraged to trust God who has done things in the past and who can do the similar things here.
today. Okay, so before we look at the chronological listing of key events that happen in history, we'll just look uh, that uh, you know the significant events that impacted the life of the church in history. We will look at a few scripture passages that you know just teach us and reiterate this point. So can somebody please read Deuteronomy chapter four verse nine? It's on page number twenty-seven in the publication. Deuteronomy chapter four verse nine. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Amen. So God is instructing Moses to tell the people what? What should Moses tell the people? What should Moses tell the people? Yes, all the stories of what God has done in the past and his dealings with his people. And why is it important for Moses to tell all these stories? So that the new, the upcoming generations who have not seen what God has done, they will know who this God is and they will not forget, you know, what God has done and what the people have experienced and what the people have learned. Okay. So it is good to look back to see how God brought us out of the PIT several times, right? God brought us out of the PIT several times. He got us out of the pit. And uh, when he, when he brought you out of the pit several times, what does it do? It encourages your faith, it strengthens your relationship with God. It also inspires that confidence in God. Okay. And when you go through another pit like experience, it just uh, uh, teaches you uh, or encourages you to anticipate how God has worked in the past and how he'll work in the future. So I don't know if uh, your past life helps you in your present and your future for most of us our past life all the negative things is what we hold on to right and we are constantly grumbling and murmuring about it but in your if you look at your past life the things that god has enabled you helped you how he brought you out of the pit then that can be a good learning that can stir up your faith that can inspire confidence um, and antis you can anticipate even god doing greater things like what he's done in the past in your lives so moses is telling the uh, god is telling moses tell the people not to forget how god has worked okay look at what uh, Josh, uh, joshua chapter 4 verses 1 to 7 says can somebody read that please and it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the jordan that the lord spoke to joshua saying take for yourselves 12 men from the people one from every tribe and command them saying Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Amen. So after crossing the Jordan, God had uh, already instructed the people that they are supposed to take 12 stones, okay? And they are supposed to make it as a memorial. Why? What was the reason? So that they won't forget, okay? So that the succeeding generations will remember, okay? When the succeeding generations look at these 12 piles of stones, they will ask, what is this? And then, you know, their fathers, their grandfathers can narrate the story of how God, you know, parted the Jordan for them and how they walked on dry ground and how they crossed over the uh, uh, Jordan. Okay. So 
just to talk about the wonderful deeds, the wonderful acts that the Lord has done and not to forget. Okay. So also in our lives, it's important to raise up memorials. Okay. I'm not talking about piles of stones, but you know, sometimes just have journals. You know, I don't know if some of you have journals, books, you know, you just write, you know, what God has done, what you went through, how God brought you out. Or some of you write journals every day, what happened in your life. And then you go back and look back, you know, and then you can remember in your old age or in your, in your adult age, you know, hey, when you just look at those diaries or those journals, my gosh, I went through this, I went through this, and you know how God has brought me out, how God sustained me, um, how God helped me through. So it's important for each one of us to raise up memorials in any which ways, whatever, you know, whether you're writing journals or whether you like to take um, snapshots and... Um, Yes, I, I know one of my seniors in Bible college, uh, from the day she joined Bible college, every, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, uh, things that we did were classes, picnic, you know, all of those activities, whatever, um, all those things, she's taken a snap and she's kept um, like a, like she's maintained a scrapbook where she's, you know, stuck all of these pictures. So all of those years of, what she's done in Bible college is all there. It's like a remembrance. It's like a memorial for her. Okay. Just to see what God has done, how he brought her to Bible college, what are the activities, or who are the people she met, and how she journeyed through uh, Bible college. So we all can do that, you know, have build up memorials so that we don't forget and we can look back and see, you know, the things that we plan, the things that we wanted to do, you know, um, uh, just write it down and see how God has fulfilled that in the years to come. You can share that with your, when you get married with your spouse, you share it with your children, or you have grandchildren, you can share it with them. It's just wonderful ways to narrate, you know, how God has been good and faithful. And all of these real life incidents is what really encourages the upcoming uh, generations because they're not interested in concepts they're learning a lot of them in school and college what they're looking for is real life testimonies real life incidents and when you talk about hey this is what god did this is where i was this is what happened to me but look what god has done and sometimes we can forget right but you know when you write out all of these things as memorials it's a good way to look back and just cherish what god has done and the last scripture passage we look at is uh, psalm chapter 44 verses 1 to 4 can somebody read that please we have heard with our ears O god our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days in days of old you drove out the nations with your hand but them you planted you afflicted the peoples and cast them out for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance. Because you favored them, you are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Amen. So what is the psalmist saying here? He's saying that you know, the preceding generations are speaking. And what are they saying? Yes, we've heard with our ears what our fathers have told us, the deeds that you have done how you drove out great nations okay uh, by your hand that means it was you who helped the israelites win the battle and when you can drive out these big nations and give us their land as possessions they're saying god you are our king and you now can command victories for jacob because you commanded victories in the past for Jacob, for the Israelites, and we have heard the great things that you have done. And so based on that, we want you to, you know, uh, command victories for us. So if you look at many of the great prayers in the Bible, most, most of them actually begin by talking about war, who God is, his greatness, and also what he has done in the past. I like Jehoshaphat's uh, I like Jehoshaphat's prayer, you know, when the three kings come to fight against him, they all fast and pray and they all go to the temple. He doesn't immediately cry out and say, God, you know, what have you, why have you brought this problem upon us? 
you know, I have been a good king. I have, re you know, uh, reinstituted the temple, cleaned it up, you know, reinstituted the worship. I've got the, uh, the scrolls. I got the priest to read it out for the people. And now why are you punishing me, God? So he could have gone and talked about all that he has done for God and blaming God that he's not, you know, doing his part. But amazing, if you see Jehoshaphat's prayer, I think it's First Chronicles chapter 16, you know, or 20, he says, you know, uh, he praises God for who he is and what he has done in the past. And then he just says one line, God, you know, uh, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Amazing prayer, right? So, you know, we when we pray those bold prayers, it's like God saying, hey, this person has come to a place of faith, looking back at what I have done and going with confidence ahead, knowing that since I have done this, I'm a God who will continue to, do it and I will help and God will come through for us because we know that you know whoever comes to Jesus by in faith when he walked on the earth he healed them all right so faith is an important ingredient and what builds up that faith what steers up that faith by looking at what he has done in the past okay so when we look at our past it inspires faith for the battles that we have to fight today in our day and time and these stories will also encourage us to believe God for similar and great victories. So sometimes if you want to pray bold prayers, look, read the scripture, look at the Old Testament and say, God, when you parted the Red Sea, you can make for me a way. Yeah, when you gave the, uh, fed the uh, Israelites manna and KFC and God gave them food from KFC, quail, right? You gave them quail and manna and you fed them nicely, God. You can feed me as well. You can provide for me. When you provided for that widow in Zerophit, God, you can provide for me, right? When you gave, um, when you opened that fish's mouth and helped the, you know, uh, disciple and you paid your tax, I'm sure you can even do that for me today. So what are we doing? We're actually putting our faith in what God has done in the past. And we are looking at him to do the similar things, greater things, than what we can even ask, think, or imagine. Amen? Amen? Okay, so it's good for us to look back, recount what God has done for us. So with that kind of a background, we will now look at church history. So we look at um, page number 28, you know, the first century. Um, so uh, on AD 30, on the day of Pentecost, okay, uh, we saw, we studied uh, the Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the book of Acts that approximately co covers 40 years that we already covered in chapter 2. So we're not going to look at that again. Okay. So AD 30 was the day of Pentecost. And also uh, after that was the 40 years of um, uh, church growth and revival and how God moved, which we studied in detail in chapter 2. Okay. Another significant thing that happened in um, the first century is AD 52, the Apostle Thomas arrives in God's own land. Where is God's own land? <laughs> in India, which is God's own land, Kerala. Kerala. Oh, yeah, Kerala. Okay. So he arrives in Malabar in the Kor Coromandel coast in India and he starts a church. Okay. Then another significant event is AD 70. We see that the Jerusalem is destroyed by the Roman uh, Emperor Titus. Okay, whole of Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed, and the Jews are asked to leave from uh, Jerusalem. Okay, and AD ninety, the Council of Jam Jamnia meet, um, and this council met together to uh, determine which are the Old Testament books, okay, written as written in Hebrew, which is um, you know uh, aligning to uh, the canonical, you know, laws that they had, the things that they had, and so they determine which are the Old Testament books that needs to be part of the canon. Canon means that which is authoritative and inspired, and which is considered as holy scriptures. Okay, so they confirmed which are the Hebrew book uh, scriptures, the Old Testament books, you know, and these books were uh, recognized as um, authoritative by the Christians. In, nine, in AD 96 to 150, we see um, 
a growing recognition of the collections of the uh, books in the New Testament and the epistles written by Paul. Okay, so it was not yet canonized, but it was, uh, you know, there was a growing recognition that these books are, you know, authoritative. These books were inspired by God, and hence it's part of Holy uh, Scripture. Okay, and in AD 99, all of the New Testament writings were completed. Another significant thing that happened is AD 100, we see Christians reported in Monaco, Algeria, and Sri Lanka. Okay, which means that so far Christianity was not just confirmed uh, to, uh, you know, uh, confined, sorry, to the Jewish or the Greek or Roman communities, but now it was making inroads into different cultural contexts, uh, including the Roman empires in the frontier regions and also reaching out to South Asia. So the gospel was moving out from the Jewish territories um, uh, and the Greco-Roman communities into South Asia and the Ro Roman empires where, it, you know, the frontier regions. Okay, so that was first century. Now we move on to second century. In the second century, we see again, there's a lot of persecution that happened. And there was a lot of heresies that came up in the church. So some of the heresies were Gnosticism, uh, Marcanism, and Montanism. Okay, So these were um, different heresies that came up. And, um, you know, so God, uh, you know, raised up many apologists. You know who are apologists? Those who defend the Christian faith against wrong teachings, heresies, wrong doctrines. And they started to speak up, address, a talk, debate, and also to make, dif uh, have different writings, you know, br bringing out different writings that were countering the uh, uh, heresies that were there. Now, some of the important apologists that we see during this era in the second century is Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, okay? So uh, Irenaeus and Justin Mart Martyr were two important apologists, where there were, of course, there were others as well. Okay, and uh, we also see Polycarp and Ignatius. These two were bishops of uh, you know different places, but they were people who were discipled by Apostle John. Okay, so Apostle John had discipled them, and so you know. Uh, they had learned a lot about the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And hence, they were in a place where they could, you know, uh, defend those heresies. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? These are the initial grassroots, yes. We see that the last apostle John died in, nine, uh, in AD 98, that is in the first century. But we see in the sec second century that people that he had taught were the people, Polycarp, Ignatius, okay, uh, they were able to defend the gospel. So what do we learn about this in our present time? How can we apply this in our present time? Can you use the mic, please? The scripture says uh, we also have to be prepared to defend the gospel. Yes, we have to be prepared to defend the gospel. So our, you know, you're studying in Bible college is not just to get a certificate or a course or degree uh, or to just learn more about the Bible. Yes, that is important to learn more about the Bible. But learning the Bible, it's important for you so that you can defend your faith, so that you can go back to your places and teach the people the truth uh, and, you know, uh, oh, that, so that they can overcome the wrong teachings and the errors that have been brought down from generations, okay? So, so important for you all to go through, learn, prepare, even as you're listening in classes, but even after that, you know, to read through so that you can prepare yourself and you're able to defend the gospel. So you see that, you know, these apostles taught, and even if they were not there, the last apostle John died, but you look at, you know, his disciples, okay, uh, whom he tutored, how they were able to defend the faith. And so also it's important for us to teach people doctrines. You know, nowadays in our churches, there is only teaching about prosperity gospel, 
you know, uh, 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 blessings, uh, you know, just simple, easy things that people love to hear. Not about sin, salvation, not about the doctrine of redemption and reconciliation and atonement and propitiation. All that is Greek and Hebrew and Latin to people because they don't know. Okay, it's not taught. So it's important that we teach them. And why should we teach people? It's because they can go ahead and defend the faith. And it's important for us to even teach our children. So whatever you all are studying in Bible college, our children in APC Children's Church are also learning the same things in their children's church. Okay, Because I'm writing the curriculum and I know. Okay, So they're learning about the doctrine of God, the biblical covenants. They're learning about the deity of God, the humanity of Jesus, Christology. They're learning about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, evangelism, all the subjects that you're learning in Bible college, we're teaching them. Because you know, we're looking at it like this. So when they come out of 10th grade, instead of coming to church as adults and not knowing anything, they'll be in a position where they can minister, they can teach, and they can also help others know the truth. So, you know, some of us, you know, in our, in our children's church, it's only stories that are narrated to them, right? Only Bible stories. But those Bible stories have deeper theological truths, right? Which we can bring about and teach the children. And some of us think, oh, we can't teach children all this. They are so young. Their minds are so young. Look at their um, school textbooks, right? I'm sure this text, when you look at this textbook, it's like, oh my gosh, we have to study so much. But look at some of the textbooks that children have. I think it's three times than this will be their chem chemistry or physics or science or math textbook, right? So big and so heavy, right? So they're learning so much, you know, in grade two, grade three, they're learning photosynthesis and all of those things. Then why can't we teach them about sin, salvation, propitiation, atonement, reconciliation? You know, they're not young because they're learning so much in school. We can teach them, but we just give them plain what milk, you know, when they are ready for solid food. And when they come ready for, when you think they're, they're youth and we can give them solid food, their moral and mental development is already happening. You know, at age of nine, a child's moral mental development is already in place. That means the child knows this is right, this is wrong. And after that, if you challenge them, they're going to challenge you. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. The age of 13, their, you know, um, their mental development has happened in things of, you know, of life. So it's important to teach children before that so that they are grounded in the truth right so so important for us and look at these uh, uh, you know apologists uh, uh, ignatius and uh, you know polycarp and irenaeus and, and and justin martyr all of them rose up to defend the christian faith so basically um, you know polycarp and ignatius were taught by apostle john and they were able to defend the deity of christ because there was a lot of wrong teachings about the deity of christ Okay, about the Lord's table, about the church's structure with bishops, pres uh, presbyters, and deacons. And so these people, you know, wrote and spoke about what the Holy Scripture talks about all of these uh, things. And we see that Ignatius of Antioch, you know, he spoke about uh, and wrote several letters concerning the deity of Jesus Christ, the Lord's table, you know, and uh, because of that, he was captured. He was taken to Rome and he was martyred. You know how he was martyred? He was fed to wild animals in the Colosseum, in the amphitheater. That means all of us, you know, when we, um, Ignatius of Antioch, you know, like all of us go to view the Olympics in a huge stadium. Olympics just got over, you know, like that in the, uh, uh, in, in those days in Rome, they had this amphitheater, the Colosseum where they used to go and, you know, they used to send out these slaves and they send wild animals. And it was such a great entertainment for them. So that is how he was martyred. Why was he martyred? Because he defended the faith. So you can see how people, how people went through so much of difficulties just to defend the, the faith and the doctrines that you and I can study today and have it in our um, hands. Okay. We are on page number 29 moving to page number 30, okay? Now we see that um, um, 
uh, Aristus, uh, you know, even he was an apologist who wrote uh, in defense of the Christian faith and he presented to the emperor. Okay, in AD 50 to AD 90, most of the books of the New Testament were clearly recognized as the canon. And, um, you know, so we already saw that the Old Testament was already recognized, okay, uh, which are the books recognized as a holy scripture. But now in AD 150 to AD 190, you know, the books of the New Testament were recognized as which are the holy scriptures because there were many uh, literature that was written many things and books were that written but uh, they chose only a few which was part of the holy uh, scriptures okay in ad 155 uh, sorry in ad 155 justin martyr you know he writes his first apology uh, he's, he was also christian apologist and he wrote defending the christian faith or the deity of christ and the sacredness of scripture Okay, so the scripture that you and I uh, ha, you and I have in hand, there are many people who paid great price with their lives just to defend the faith, just to you know uh, pr you know prevent any uh, wrong teachings and wrong books come coming into the scripture or to be you know taken as scripture and uh, you know. And that's why we have our scriptures in our hand, and so we need to value you know what these people have done so he was an apologist who wrote about the deity of christ and the sacredness of scripture okay and in ad 155 polycarp you know who was uh, uh, who learned under apostle john he trained another historian called irenaeus okay now irenaeus went on to become a bishop so in ad 183 to ad 186 irenaeus was a bishop he was also a disciple of polycarp and he also writes various writings to defend the Christian faith. And his works are both doctrinally and historically very, very important. Okay, Because his writings preserve the truth about the deity of Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, also defends the uh, sacredness of scripture. Okay. Now we move on to the third century. Okay, again, the church in the third century is attacked with various heresies and is persecuted. The same thing that is happening today in our churches as well. So we see um, that in AD 202 to AD 211, the emperor forbids conversion to Christianity, but however, Christianity continues to spread. Okay, so many people try to stop the work of the gospel try to stop people from accepting the gospel but christianity continued to spread because it's not the work of a man it's the work of god and it's the power of the holy spirit yes please take the meaning of heresy ma heresy is wrong teachings basically you know false teachings or wrong uh, teachings okay which is uh, so wrong and so, um, uh, you know, um, uh, erroneous that it is, you know, like it's like a, it's, it's profane. It's, uh, you know, it's like a sacrilege. It's something that is totally, uh, you know, uh, going against the whole uh, truth. Yes, so heresy, deviating. Heresy refers to something only with regard to our Bible and scriptures which they've written against or just to ask you, even if uh, can we say like Quran is also like a heresy or Bhagavad Gita is also heresy? Just asking. Okay. Heresy is only against the Bible that they've like written, or do we also say what the others follow is also a heresy? Like, yeah, because that is totally not the truth, right? It's just uh, something that is a uh, 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 you know is man-made. Uh, but when you talk about heresy, it's something that is, you know, going against the truth that you believe, and it's totally diverting the truth, and it's very sacrilegious, you know. So um, we'll move on. So we see that even though that, you know, um, uh, the emperor tried to stop Christianity, okay, Christianity continued to uh, spread, okay. But during this time, 
uh, there is an important thing that happened in 8300 to the rise of monasticism okay the the church had become very very worldly okay and so they uh, a few people who were you know um, uh, 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 who were studying the scriptures knew that this was all wrong the, the, and things that were happening in the church was not right it was very worldly uh, there's a lot of worldliness and immorality coming to the church so they decided they will move away and they will live a secluded lifestyle they will live separate okay so they spent all of their time just reading the word praying and also preserving the scriptures again you know, there was a great um, uh, 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 need for to defend the scriptures okay so they spent a lot of time praying and reading the word and then we see that this monasticism you know started basically with a few individuals but then it later on developed into communities many of them were impacted by these um, uh, by these monks okay because we see that you know they were uh, uh, moving in the supernatural in a mighty way there was a mighty move of the holy spirit they were um, uh, doing many signs healings and wonders and because of people were hearing this many people were coming and so they were known as uh, the church fathers or the desert fathers because they were living in the desert and many people travel all the way into the desert to come to these monks so that they can receive healing and uh, deliverance and so we see that you know the work of the supernatural continued even in this um, in the um, third century okay so we think that you know um, uh, we think that uh, the, the supernatural stopped you know with the early church and there was nothing happening after that but that's wrong we see this happening in the um, third century okay uh, in AD 300 with this uh, rise of monasticism okay so they help continue the work of the holy spirit and um, the miracles were happening so the working of miracles did not cease with the last apostle we see that these uh, you know monks were doing great science miracles and wonders in the third century and they were doing it in the name of jesus christ and they also preserved the scriptures and the doctrines okay because there's a great need to preserve the scriptures and the doctrines and we see that in AD 300 as well, North Africa became a key Christian center, okay? And Egypt alone had one million, you know, Christians by the end of the third century, okay? We see that the role of bishops continued to grow and strengthen during this time. But it's very sad that in AD 303, you know, there was a great um, move that happened in Africa that kind of divided the church. Okay, so I'll just briefly tell you. Um, now, in AD 303, the emperor, uh, um, dialectician, you know, he persecutes the church and he wants, he intends to wipe off the church, but he fails. Okay. Uh, Diocletian, he tries to persecute the church and he wants to wipe out the entire church, but he fails. But in, in 311, we see that the Donistus, you know, a group of people, they come up and this group of people, they try to preserve, you know, um, the church from those people who fell away during the persecution. Now, this um, uh, emperor, you know, uh, Diocletian, he said that you have to make pagan sacrifices, you know, you have to worship the pagan gods. If you're not, you would be persecuted. So many of them had to choose between faith in Jesus Christ and whether they would be persecuted and killed. So many of them chose to, you know, worship the pagan gods and things like that. But when, you know, the emperor was no longer there and this rule was no longer there, they came back to the church now when they came back to the church you know the people in the church said hey you are all traitors right when the emperor persecuted us you did not stand up for your faith and some of them were priests and uh, bishops and leaders in the church and when they came back you know these donatists you know said 
you cannot be part of the church because you are traitors. Okay, um, uh, you left the church. You 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 know you renounced your faith. Uh, you could have faced the punishment and the persecution, but you chose not to. You renounced the faith, and now you can't come back and you can't be restored to your position as leaders, as priests, and bishops. Okay, and so there was a great divide because the rest of the church said, "Hey." It's okay, these people have done a mistake. They have done sins, but the church is not just for the saints. It's also sinners who be repent and become saints. And they said that you can't, you know, administer the Holy Communion. So uh, the rest of the church said that, hey, it's not, you know, Holy Communion is uh, administering, is it's not essential for you know, the spiritual integrity of the minister was not essential for the sacraments to be effective. That means even if a minister is not holy in that sense, even if he ministers the sacraments, it's not going to affect them because the person who's taking it is going to believe in the finished work of the cross. And it's they're going to receive that through grace. And they said it's not through the purity of the priests. And so because of this, there was a great division that happened in the church in Africa, in Northern Africa. Okay. And it went about, the division went on for 300 years. Can you imagine? 300 years this division was happening. And I was like, oh my God, because, you know, look at AD 300, North Af Africa became a key center for Christianity. All of you following? Or I'm just... Uh, you are following? So AD 300, we see that, you know, Africa becomes a key center and that Egypt alone has 1 million Christians by the end of 3rd century. And here there is a great, you know, when there's a great move of God, there's a great persecution as well. And you look at this, just this division for this thing brought about a division for how many years? 300 years. And when I read this, I was like, hey, didn't God do anything? You know, 300 years, the church is going to suffer. And it's sad to read because after this, you know, um, uh, Africa, Northern Africa, which was one of the strongest earlier centers of the church, actually was weakened and eventually it lost to Christianity. So sad to read that, right? lost to Christianity, even though it was one of the strongest centers of Christianity, it was lost to Christianity. And in the seventh century, we have the, you know, uh, Muslim rulers come and invade. And we see now when we look at Africa, most of Africa is what? It's a Muslim nation, right? It's a continent, so, so many Muslims, and it's so sad. But when you look at this and say, hey, in 300 so many Christians and it lost out on Christianity. What really happened it was because of this, just one small thing. But, you know, yes, God did move. You know, he raised up people like, um, uh, you know, he raised up people like Tertullian and Augustine who came and, uh, you know, taught the people um, the right things. So we'll um, stop here and after the break, we look at what Augustine did uh, oh, and whether he tried to help the people in North Africa to overcome this division and what happened to North Africa. Okay, we'll stop here and come back after the break. Thank you.